All right, moving on next, we're setting the stage for an electrifying talk with two very special speakers and Mr. Chandranath from Devrim. Imagine transforming India into a powerhouse with a hundred billion dollar tech business in just 10 years. Let's find out more as to how that's possible. Inviting Chandra on stage, please. Give him a big hand, ladies and gentlemen. Chandra, can we please have you on stage? The one. Thank you so much. Well, I've been very impressed all day today. It's uh, it's been um, really inspiring to see the type of um, innovation that India is driving and the scale at which it drives it. Um, we're going to have two guests who are going to come here talking about how we unlock India's potential. Well, something that stood out for me for both these folks, and I'm going to invite them here in a moment, is we have Karan Mehta from Kisht. Why don't you come on stage? And we've got Dhruv Agarwal from Shipsy. And as I've been talking to them, right now, Kisht is driving millions of digital consumer loans. Um, we're talking about 3 million loans a month. We're talking about, right now, Dhruv at Shipsy, driving 5 million shipments a day. That's almost 2 billion annually. And this just boggles my mind. And when I think about loans at that scale, Karan, it's like, I remember 10 years ago, and I used to work at Capital One, the idea of credit models being available, us being able to do these types of things here without FICO scores or something like that, just seemed like an impossibility. And then when I talk about the scale of shipments and global logistics that you're driving, another one of those things is how can that happen? I, I used to do Ola and marketplaces and trying to get drivers to places. But you guys have done this, and you've done this in less than 10 years. So I'd love to get into a bit of a discussion about how did you achieve this, and then how do we take this forward over the next decade? So maybe a few words from both of you, and then we can jump into the question at hand, which is how do we build the future of India? Uh, no, so uh, Chandra, I think uh, it's been an interesting eight years, Kish and Ring are around eight years old. Uh, when we started, of course, we could not have expected the scale at which we are at. I think it's not just us evolving the entire ecosystem, uh, ecosystem in the form of government stack, uh, peers of ours who also drive for innovation, SaaS companies that have allowed us to do some of the more boring stuff like compliance in a much seamless, much more seamless fashion. A lot of things have come together. And of course, you know, the consumers have gotten tech savvy, consumers have gotten more demanding, customers have gotten uh, access to uh, more resources uh, themselves. Uh, very interesting journey. I think what, what also remains to be seen is how the next eight, 10 years uh, unfold. And I think very relevant uh, discussion of, we've just scratched the surface of India's potential or probably just warmed it up. Uh, I think we are just gonna see it uh, really take off now. Dhruv, words from you? So, uh, you know, our journey has been pretty interesting. Uh, like myself and my co-founder, you're working in actually investment banks and, you know, using platforms like Bloomberg on a day-to-day. -day. And uh, when we looked at e-commerce kind of growing up and how the data is organized in this industry, it was very different. And we were thinking, why can't this industry also have something like a Bloomberg? Uh, and that got us thinking. And we looked at it from an out outsider's perspective and asked, started asking questions. Uh, how, can, how, how can we build something from scratch with first principles that solves the problem of the industry that it needs to grow. Uh, you know, we have the stalwarts of the e-commerce industry here with us, and he can tell you, e-commerce, when it was starting, and I was a customer of Mintra back in the day, in 2013, 2014, the, the logistics experience of getting the deliveries was not the same as it is today, and that was the reason why a lot of E-commerce companies in India had to start their own logistics companies as well because the consumer demand was not being able to fulfill by the current uh, suppliers in the industry. And kind of when we deep dived, we realized they don't have the technology that is required to deliver the experience that is required in today's world. And that kind of that was the start of our journey. Today we are processing five million shipments a day, uh, you know, uh, and you know, build a lot of technology around this. I uh, would love to talk more in detail about that, yeah. Well, I mean, with so many technology leaders here today, maybe a forward-looking question. I mean, how do we build, and we kind of said this number, $100 billion revenue SaaS companies over the next decade. I mean, I think it's very possible. I don't know, Karan, what do you think about that as a, as a goal? Oh, I, I think uh, 
uh, when you asked me that question earlier, right, what I was just thinking through is all of the things that I do uh, in my role as a founder and a CTO over the course of one week, uh, apart from the core engineering and the core product, there are, I think, a good 20, 30 items that I w have to do. There's, there are legal things I have to do. There are compliance things I have to do. There, there are HR things I have to do. None of them are core. And if I were to literally stack up my entire week's worth of productive time, less than 30 or 40% of my time is being spent on the core activities that I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, very, very easy uh, for those problems to be taken away by someone else completely. And that, that's what we are looking at. And within the course of a week, I see gap for at least 30 to 40 different SaaS companies and take away those things. Uh, one of the examples when we were talking earlier, right? Uh, a friend of mine from another organization was, is facing massive issues with, uh, with dealing with InfoSec compliances, built a tool for his company, just literally the next day he formed a company and started offering that services. We consume it, so many other Indians consume it. Just that thought is a very powerful thought, that you want to focus on the core and to run an organization of, of the size of, say, uh, Kish or Shipsy, there are many, many gaps that can be filled by SaaS companies. We don't want to do it. We'd much rather have someone take over that. Uh, and you're talking about FinTech. There'll be problems in logistics. There'll be problem in EdTech. Uh, all of them put together, very easy to get there. Yeah, there, there's certainly this horizontal theme because not everyone needs to build all the capa capabilities in-house. So maybe a question for you, uh, Dhruv. When you think about building uh, these sort of horizontal Indian solutions for India, but then taking that to the rest of the world. How do you think about Indian SaaS over the next decade, not just being Indian SaaS, but being SaaS for everybody? Uh, no, uh, great question, and actually, uh, you know, our journey has been very interesting from the perspective. So typically, you'll see a lot of SaaS companies now in India, based out of India and selling to the world. The way we started our journey was actually selling to India. A uh, lot of people used to think you can't really sell SaaS in India because this, nobody's gonna pay. Uh, but there is, there is good demand, there is a lot of growth, the overall consumption is growing, and you know, now DevRev being in Mumbai speaks a lot, right? Uh, uh, so there is, there is consumption uh, in the domestic market as well. Uh, some of the challenges, actually, if you look at uh, that we needed to solve in India, because of the complex infrastructure, the diversity that existed in the industry, that were actually much more complex to some of the developed markets. And now when over time we started approaching to some of the developed markets in logistics supply chain, uh, we, find out, we found out that you know, a lot of these problems are simpler. So you know, it's, it's relatively sim easier while the user experiences and the user behavior does definitely is, uh, is different and does require you to localize. But uh, I think there's a huge opportunity uh, for India to build here and sell abroad. We have a lot of engineering talent, technical talent, uh, and role models to look up to now. We have you know, Indian CEOs uh, in majority of the tech companies in the world. So you know, there, is, there is a lot of those things at play as well. Uh, like we can look at uh, you know, the biggest tech companies now, and you know, we see uh, Indians running that. So I think it's, it's, it's our time now. Yeah. Well, I, I, I remember taking Ola to Australia, New Zealand, to London. Um, it was actually easier to take the product from here, and then it was about pairing it back actually a little bit. Um, maybe a question about the Indian sort of ecosystem, regulatory environment. How do you think about that as an enabler? No, I, I think uh, in the context of regulated spaces like lending, insurance, I think the regulators are also doing a fantastic job. Uh, I think those uh, verticals are not that primed to go international. When it comes to the larger software space or the SaaS space, I think uh, the Indian government has historically also done well, right? There have been special uh, dispensations for software export companies. The, the concept of a special economic zone for software is, is, is a brilliant thing. In, India needs that. India needs to be able to build software, export it to the world, uh, get in the foreign exchange flowing in. Um, and you know, I, I've, I've been thinking that uh, if I were to build a SaaS company in India, I will obviously start with immediately selling to both Indian and international customers. And in the back of my mind, there are no impediments. It feels as mm. simple as, say, getting an office space in New York or getting an office space in Australia and have a sales team start, start to sell that. All the hurdles of, of selling internationally are really non-existent. And on the contrary, I think the Indian government has put a lot of push in to make it happen, make it much, much more simpler. The red tape is gone. 
if you are bringing in dollars into, into the Indian ecosystem, trust me, it's a much, much easier job now than it was 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I think it's, it's prime time for India to be able to export SaaS, um, and, and we have almost all of the right ingredients to be able to do that. Dhruv, I know you've been taking advantage of this as well in some ways. Why don't you share that with the audience? You're yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, in some ways Indian government has actually innovated a lot in some of the new platforms, you know, starting from UPI, ONDC, ULIP. So a lot of focus on bringing down, if you talk about the supply chain industry, a lot of focus on bringing down the logistics cost from 13 14% to now, uh, which is close to 8%. Uh, and government has realized a lot of it is going to be through infrastructure. A lot of it is going to simplifying a lot of processes and using technology. So, you know, a lot of these platforms that are being made available, it is giving startups a great opportunity to actually build on top of that, enable uh, not just enterprises, but also SMEs. Now, if India has to compete at a global scale and, you know, export to the world, uh, you know, the SMEs need to be enabled. They need to have the right tools to be able to compete with you know, some of the most de more developed markets like China, et cetera. Uh, and I think technology can play a big role there. So we see ourselves as a big contributor to that as well, alongside uh, in terms of uh, a market opportunity, definitely it creates a very different market opportunity. And not just that, I think a lot of these things, uh, with like we, we had like a recent uh, you know, event in France where you know, uh, our prime minister was there and UPI is being launched there in some shape or form. So, I think overall in terms of the brand as well, now the way the world is looking at Indian technology is very different. Now uh, it's no longer services. A lot of new products are coming out of India. Uh, so I think it's a very good time to build in India. Overall, we are very excited about that. You said something interesting earlier too, which is a mindset shift that's occurring around things that earlier would not have been thought about when it comes to PMs and engineers hearing directly from the customer. T talk to what's the evolution of that mindset over the next decade? So, uh, I mean, myself being, uh, you know, building technology and then coming into an industry and building SaaS, the mindset had to change because, you know, I love getting down and solving the problem uh, on the desk. But when you're building a product, you have to get your hands dirty, which comes, which brings the whole thought of the product thinking, right? And that's something that may not have traditionally existed because of the way industry evolved. So I think the whole mindset of bringing the builders of technology closer to the customers, and I think that's one of the things I love about the DevRev team and the philosophy in the product, is that how we can bring the people who are building closer to the customers so that they can actually empathize and build things that are valuable for the users. Right? So it's not just about churning out features or like writing code, it's actually about building something useful, which, is, uh, which can be easily used as well, and you get your feedback real time. Uh, for in, in our instance, we actually uh, did deliveries ourselves for two, three months to understand what are the pain points for the drivers, because that's not something we know, uh, you know people in the room. Uh, haven't experienced yet. So we actually did that for a good amount of time to actually understand the challenges so that we could build something that would be useful for the users. So I think it's uh, that whole product thinking and the user-centric and the customer-centric thinking uh, is something that is very, very important for, uh, for us to kind of focus on while you know, we have a great uh, engineering talent already in this country. Yeah. Karan, how about you when you think about just, building I'm products? I'm just going to cut in. It's, uh, what I'm going to say is going to sound literally like a shameless uh, pitch for DevRef, but guys, I'm, I'm not <laughs> sponsored by them in any way. Uh, but, you know, over, it's very coincidentally that we're talking about that. Uh, over the last three months at Kishten Ring, one of the biggest discoveries we've had, and, and because of a lot of external factors, uh, some of the biggest customer issues never made it back to the product team. It's just a broken organization in a manner of speaking. There was a customer support team that was receiving all those requests. They were hacking uh, their way around just to make the customers happy, but not able to pass the feedback back to the product team. Uh, things were discovered, and we, when we asked the product team, why didn't you fix it? Like, we weren't aware. And uh, we have our customer support on a completely different island, a different platform, a different office space, literally in a different city almost. Uh, the product team works in their own silo, uh, literally firefighting business priorities and things like that. A huge part of their KRA is, is, is customer happiness, but the, the pipe didn't exist. Uh, when we doubled down on the customer support request, it literally were the, the 
top two or three were items that could have been fixed in a matter of week. Wow. We just couldn't fix it because we didn't know. And um, one of the things that we've been working at Kish over the last three months is just to fix uh, the bridge between customer support and product. Uh, and, and uh, you know, things like operating on different silos is, is so easy to fix, but we've not been able to do it. What does that mean for the next generation of talent? cultures and organizations, especially financial services organizations and many financial institutions that are here today. When you think about, we have this youthful population, half this country is less than 25, the culture of trust and talent nurturing, giving them visibility, obviously within privacy means and things like that. Is there something when you think about the financial services industry and what that means? No, I know. Uh, so, uh, you know, a uh, few members of my product team are here in the audience. A lot of them are looking at the live stream right now. I think. One of the things I've noticed is they are a lot more curious than I am. As a founder of the organization, they're, they're a lot more curious about their departments than I can ever be. What you want to do with them is empower them. You tell them that this is your domain. You have to solve the problem. It's not my problem at all. And, and I'll trust you to do your best. And I'm almost certain that their best will be far better than if I were to micromanage or do their role. Uh, and a lot of the times, you have uh, folks who don't have a lot of experience but I think that lack of experience is actually a boon because they, they come up with fresh ideas. When you're trying to solve problem in credit, my target audience is 24 to 35. Uh, the average age of my target audience is 27. The average age of my product team is around 26. They're going to understand the problem a lot better than I will be able to understand the problem. And, and what has worked for us is to start trusting them a lot more. When we were a smaller organization, we used to be micromanaging, it was very top down. Now you want a product team and an engineering team that come up with ideas, come up with their own solutions and start solving them and they come back to you when they've already solved the problem saying that, oh, look, we did this. It has had that impact. That's at least uh, the path that India is uh, right now on. Your views on talent for the future? I think uh, some of these uh, new age technologies has been a boon for India, like mobile revolution, it democratized access to information for Indians. Now whole, the Gen AI as well, I think it's gonna democratize intelligence, education, a lot of these things. So I think I'm very excited again about the large population that we have that can now be better engineers, better product managers, and I think we can build the next generation of world-class products in India. So really looking forward to that. Awesome, so maybe a parting question here for everybody in the audience. What's sort of your parting words around the next decade and building these billion dollar revenue SaaS companies and kind of maybe the most in the world from India? Well, maybe sort of some parting words that you have for all of us. Yeah, I mean, um, learn from the best. Uh, we have a lot of people here, so <laughs> I think it's taking a lot of inspiration from that. And I think the opportunity is right there for us. So I think it just down to execution. Uh, heads down execution. I think that's something that uh, you know some of the biggest companies out there have done really well. So, yeah, looking forward to doing that. Sticking to the ethos of the original question, right? I at least my parting thought is, within whatever you're doing, uh, even the smallest part, stand alone is a problem to be solved for as a SaaS organization for a lot of people. If you're very good at solving one problem for your organization just take a step back and think that whether it's worth solving that for everyone else. And, and that's some of the things that we've been applying with a lot of the things we are doing. Uh, and it's, it's quite uh, revelatory. You feel that, oh, this piece, we've built it, we are, we've done a good job. I'm glad it contributed to the company's bottom line. But oh, maybe it can con contribute to the country's GDP also if you do it right. Well, I know we're very enthusiastic about that. We've invested heavily in uh, India, of course, and the talent here, and we're looking forward to this for several decades, if not more. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Round of applause. We're cutting in through here. Appreciate it.